let me introduce uh, our guest speaker. She is Emma Smith, a good friend of mine, uh, a woman of trans experience. She travels extensively throughout the United States and Europe, uh, logs tens of thousands of air miles on behalf of her company, Air Products. In the past, she's worked as a copywriter and an editor. She even has experience as an Uber driver, where as she said at the time, she put the trans in transportation. Um, she is active in and on behalf of the LGBTQ community, uh, where she volunteers on the LGBTQ Business Council of her local Chamber of Commerce, her local LGBTQ Community Center. She also serves on the board of directors of our organization. She's also the lead for um, Air Products LGBTQ Employee Resource Group Spectrum. And tonight she's going to be talking about best practices for traveling while trans. So please welcome Emma Smith. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Corinne. I appreciate that very gracious introduction. Uh, and that's going to save me some time talking about myself. Um, I did just want to mention, too, that I'm really into astronomy and astrophysics. So I'm another, I'm another one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I'm Emma Smith. Uh, as Corinne said, I work for Air Products. The most recent role I've had there is uh, working as the global training lead. Um, for a new tool that we have called uh, Open Text, and so we've been—I've been working on a project uh, related to that for quite some time, and uh, that's kind of what initiated this whole um, travel for work kind of thing. And that's always been a dream for me. Um, I just recently turned 40 years old, and I, you know, for a long time I wanted to have a job where I could travel. As a child, our family went on lots of road trips and I was, you know, I've been to 38 of the 50 uh, states in the U.S. and um, I, I didn't actually travel internationally except for to Canada until um, just a few years ago. So uh, I was lucky enough to um, have my name changed on before I actually applied for my passport, uh, but we you know, we will probably talk a little bit more about that, those logistics later. Um, just a couple other things about myself. Uh, so I um, grew up in the Allentown, Pennsylvania area. I'm originally from Utah, though, and I have spent some time living out in southern Utah in a place called Moab. Uh, and then I went to college uh, later in life in a place uh, called Logan, Utah, at, a, at Utah State University. And when I graduated, I moved back here to Pennsylvania. Uh, as Corinne said, I was working for a while uh, as a copy editor and a copywriter. I have degrees in journalism and sociology. And uh, after uh, I got laid off from um, my, my last copy editing job, I was just barely in transition and just barely came out and was wondering what the heck I was going to do with myself. And uh, so I ended up jumping behind the wheel as an Uber driver for a while uh, and did that to, to kind of make ends meet until one day I got a call from Air Products, actually a, a agency re uh, representing Air Products. And they said, hey, are you interested in this job? At that time, I hadn't had my legal name change done, and my resume had my uh, dead name on it, and so I was posed, uh, you know, facing this question of what name do I apply with, and do I go as myself, or do I continue to remain in the closet? And I went, I, I decided to take the leap and go as as myself, and um, that's really made all the difference. Uh, I've been at Air Products for uh, about three and a half years now. So in uh, relative to my co a lot of my coworkers, I'm still a newbie there. Um, there's folks who've worked at Air Products for 20, 30, even some who've worked there for 40 years. Uh, so, and it's really uh, cool because it's in the STEM field, uh, which is completely outside of my liberal arts degrees. Um, but I, I'm able to apply a lot of what I've picked up uh, throughout my life, um, just from experience there, and and believe it or not, liberal arts degrees are uh, have really come in handy <laughs> working with mostly engineers. Um, so anyway, uh, that's just a little bit about my myself. I did also just want to mention that the things that I'm going to talk about are my experience as an out trans woman who's traveled to several westernized cities and countries. Um, my experiences may differ from anyone else's experiences. There may be folks on this uh, webinar who have traveled a, a lot more than I have um, to a lot more places, uh, and that's fine. 
Um, this content is meant to inform and inspire you to do further research and preparation as you consider your own travel, whether that's domestic or abroad. Um, and then I'll just give you a heads up that at the end of this uh, presentation, I have uh, lots of resources that we'll talk about and, and everything in this deck is hyperlinked. So uh, if the slide deck is made available later, there's going to be lots of hyperlinks in, the, in it that you can click for more resources on the subject. <clears throat> okay, so what might you expect to learn from this discussion? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what you, sh what you might need to know before you actually take off for your trip, um, how to prepare for your trip, how to protect yourself from ignorance. And, uh, and when I say ignorance, I don't necessarily mean like the negative connotation of ignorance. I just mean, you know, it could be that or just maybe people who uh, have never interacted with a trans person before. Um, also how to travel safer and smarter. And then I'm going to share a lot of anecdotes uh, uh, about my own experiences, uh, some positive and some not so positive. Uh, and then finally, uh, like I said, we'll have some additional resources that we'll go through and take a look at as well. All right, so our itinerary, uh, our itinerary for this trip is going to start with an icebreaker. So we're going to do a little bit of a thought exercise. Uh, and then after the icebreaker, oops. Sorry. After the icebreaker, we'll talk a little bit about why we travel um, and then also how and where we might go and then things to think about. Uh, as promised, I'm going to share some of my personal experiences and then uh, we'll look at those additional resources and then hopefully have some time for additional Q&A. OK, so I'd like everybody to um, take a few moments and imagine that you're traveling and this could be uh, you know, you are a place that you've traveled to before. Maybe it's a place you've never gone. I just want you to think about where it is you're traveling to. And if you want, you can even pick two places. Maybe pick a place that you would never see yourself going to and maybe pick a place where you always wanted to visit. Okay. And then once you have in mind what that place is, I want you to think about, have you ever been there before? So is this a place you're familiar with or is this a place that you don't know anything about? Or maybe you know just a little bit about it and you wanna know a lot more. Is this place domestic? Meaning is it within the United States and its territories or is it abroad? Meaning you're going international. So now I want you to think, now that you have this place in mind, I want you to think, or these places, I want you to think about what aspects of your identity might put you at risk. And here's just a, a little identity wheel, wheel that has some identity aspects. There may be others that you take into consideration as well. So things like your beliefs and ideologies, your socioeconomic status, your education, your career, um, sexual or romantic orientation, your age, race, ethnicity, gender identity, and expression. Can't forget that one. So which of these identities put you at risk in this place where you're going or, or you think might put you at risk? On the flip side of that, I want you to think about what aspects of your identity might give you privilege. And so now we're going to relate it to the, this topic. So think about this from the perspective of if you're trans or gender expansive and you're in transition or presenting your gender identity while you travel, think about what if anything would be different pre-transition or if you were not presenting your gender identity. If you're trans or gender expansive and not in transition, think about how your experience might differ if you were in transition. So we, we have one quick yeah comment. I saw I'm yeah. looking at that so so this is this is meant to be so when I say gender expansive I, I'm opening it up to anything under the umbrella so it's not binary it's it's not um, meant to just be you know if you identify transgender but also you know if for example if you're cross-dressing or partial cross-dressing or maybe you're gender queer or non-binary and your gender expression may not fit you know, within the rigid confines of a binary gender expression. So yeah, great question and thank you for asking that. 
Um, also, if you're not trans and you're listening to this, um, I'd like you to consider maybe what would be different for you if you were trans and you're tra or gender expansive and you're, uh, or maybe you're, and, and add the clarifier that you're out and trans or gender expansive and traveling. So I know that I traveled a lot before I um, came out and started my transition. And so when that was the case, I looked different and I sounded a little bit different. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I had uh, a lot of privilege because I'm white and because I speak English and I'm college educated, um, you know, and then when being a trans person and being out and traveling as trans, that adds like so many other layers to this. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot that I need to, um, to think about. And so the point is, or at least one of the points is that self-awareness uh, and, and vigilance toward your surroundings can literally mean the difference between life and death. Um, in 2019, I went to the Out and Equal Workplace Summit, and one of the first, the first day, one of the seminars I attended was um, a seminar on traveling as an LGBTQ plus person. And this is something that somebody there said. Some of the other things that folks shared is like, obviously, the country that you're going to is an important consideration. Uh, is it a westernized country? I mean, have they adopted similar uh, cultures and ideologies that we have here in the United States or in Western Europe? Or is it uh, not a westernized uh, area? And, and might there be certain laws or cultures in that area that could even lead to you dying a legal death in that country, according to their you know, view, worldview. Um, so let's, to, let's think about there as well. Uh, definitely race, ethnicity, and skin color are going to be things that come into play. I remember somebody saying that in Japan, as an American, they were kind of able to escape any of the same types of norms and cultural mores that Japanese folks uh, enforce on themselves. And that going to a place like Japan, according to this person, they kind of had, you know, they kind of had like a free pass, so to speak. So I've always thought about, OK, I wonder what it would be like if I go to Japan um, with my job. I may end up tra uh, traveling to India and China one day soon, um, obviously post pandemic, uh, because we have large presences in both of those regions. So that's something I definitely think a lot about. We also have. Uh, presence in in the Middle East, where in a lot of countries, and, and South America, where there's countries where it is it's illegal, um, same sex relationships are punishable by death, uh, and gender marker changes are illegal. And uh, on, on top of the legal aspect, there's also cultural issues that uh, would would be very transphobic and anti-LGBTQ. So these are all real things that we need to keep in mind as we're considering our travel. Okay, so um, also depending on your destination, various parts of your identity may be associated with different risks or benefits. And um, being transgender or gender expansive, it, it's likely to always be a, con a consideration. Um, many out trans folks don't have this option to code switch when they travel. Uh, I've spoken to folks who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, and they say, uh, you know, when they travel, they just don't tell anybody that they're gay, lesbian, or bisexual. This idea is known as code switching, where you can kind of um, leave a part of your identity behind or keep it secret. And for folks who uh, may be, you know, cross-dressers or transgender and not fully out, this might still be an option for you. Um, but on the flip side of that, uh, those of us who are out and um, in, you know, fully in transition or far along that path, uh, if we don't have passing privilege, it's definitely important to understand the risks. And I personally, uh, I probably am about 70% passable from my own perspective. As soon as I start talking, people start clocking me. Um, I also, my height and my body shape are also aspects of me that tend to give, you know, most folks the clue that I'm transgender. So wherever I go, I'm taking that with me. Um, so that's really important to understand how that's going to potentially impact your experience and your safety. Okay. 
Um, any before we move on to the next section, any comments from the audience about this? Any things, any light bulb moments that anybody uh, thought of as they were as they were going through this? Any unique identity traits or considerations that popped into your mind as we were going through this? I think it's just it's really important that we understand that. Um, uh, you know, kind of from a global perspective that, you know, different cultures, while we could view their cultural perspective as wrong um, from our perspective, from their perspective, uh, they may view that as absolutely right. And we are wrong. And what, it's important to remember that we're in their country and we're on their territory. Yes. And so it's always important to, you know, kind of have that emic versus, uh, uh, edict perspective a little bit. Yeah. No, yeah. great point, Corinne. And and as you know, a sociolo with a sociologist background, um, I I you know I took this anthropology course in college, and they talked about this concept of cultural relativism versus ethnocentricity. By the way, thank you for the comment. Uh, I appreciate that. That was very nice. Um, you know, so cultural relativism being the kind of the opposite of of ethnocentricity where we think ethnocentricity is this idea that our culture is the right culture and everyone else has to bend to that. Whereas when, as Karen said, when you go into another place, they're going to think that same way. <laughs> uh, and, and so it's important as, as a, a foreigner or an outsider that you are sensitive to that and, um, and try to be more culturally, culturally relative. And I really like that. I like that sense of wonder when I go to a new place. I want to experience what the locals experience. In some places, though, I'm just I'm restricted from doing that. Um, so it's important to stress. All right, so let's now talk about just some basics, right? So why do we travel? What are some of the reasons we travel? Where do we go and, and how do we get there? Um, so as we talk about this, these basic questions, I'd like you to keep thinking about what kinds of special considerations uh, you might have as a trans person or as gender expansive, uh, you know, as, as you think about this stuff. Okay, so why do we travel? Um, by the way, a lot of these pictures are pictures that I took on my personal travels. This one here is uh, in Munich, Germany. Um, and I walked like an extra two miles just to get that shot. <laughs> but it was worth it, in my opinion. <laughs> All right, so we might travel for business. That's a big reason that I ended up going uh, international. Um, it might be for a convention or a trade show. Uh, not a lot of this stuff happening right now, but hopefully in the near future, we'll, we'll be doing this stuff again. Of course, vacation, tourism, pleasure, that's all uh, a common one. Um, kind of related to that, wedding. Uh, so a lot of folks travel for weddings uh, and funerals, on the other hand, um, is another reason we might travel. Legal obligations. Um, so maybe uh, you're getting divorced or or maybe there's an estate sale or something like that that re results in a legal obligation. Similarly, moving, right? Obviously, you're, if you're moving, it might be traveling down the street, but you're still technically traveling. Uh, and usually it moves a little bit further and you're gonna end up being in a place where there's potentially other cultures and other uh, ideological considerations and possibly legal. Uh, and then making a purchase or picking something up. So I know folks who have like traveled across the country. Uh, in fact, I, a guy I work with, he asked me when the next time I was going uh, to, um, I just saw a comment I'll respond to in a second, but he, he, was ask, he asked me when I was going to the UK next because there was a pinball machine uh, in Southern England that he was interested in buying because he collects pinball machines. Um, and I said, well, not for a while, but I'll let you know. <laughs> Um, I was not walking in heels. I'm, I'm not a, a heels girl very often, so I do wear heels from time to time, but um, I'm, a, I'm definitely a city girl. Uh, I've been going to, to New York City since I was four years old, <laughs> so I do a lot of walking in sneakers <laughs> and flats. Um, but yeah, uh, good, good point. <laughs> All right, and then finally, I threw one in here. Um, it's, you know, escape to one's true identity. And the reason I put this um, is it released, recently occurred to me, I know some folks who are not, you know, maybe they're trans or they're cross-dressers and they're not fully out, 
um, or not in transition and they take advantage of going someplace new um, maybe because they're away from a spouse uh, who doesn't know about their identity or it's also a place where nobody is likely to know you. Although I will warn you, there's been more than one occasion where I've randomly bumped into somebody from my hometown that was, I was in a place far away and it was very, uh, you know, unlikely to have bumped into somebody I knew. Uh, one time it was on a plane um, in a state across the country from where I lived. And then the other time it was on a ferry going to Liberty Island. <laughs> And so these are places where you, there's not a lot of people there to begin with. They're far from home. And you, I, you know, you just gotta, it's a small world, I guess, gotta say. Um, but, uh, you know, if you go to, uh, if you're traveling to a place where you know is safe and accepting, um, it can actually offer a trans person who isn't fully out or in transition this opportunity to experiment with their identity. Um, it's just important to do that carefully. And I know trans women who have done this um, just recently. I was talking to somebody who did that. So that's something to think of as well. Uh, and when our conferences and our, our conventions start back up, I know a lot of folks like going to Keystone and the Trans Wellness Conference, and those can offer that same kind of you know, place where you know it's a fairly safe space to be, and it gives you that chance to you know, fully explore your identity. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about where we might travel. So we may go to uh, somewhere domestic or somewhere abroad. Maybe it's interstate or within the same region. Uh, maybe it's across the country. It could be a multi-city trip and it could even be international or a world tour. Uh, so all of these different um, types of travel of, or places to go are, are going to have different considerations for you when you're planning on going. Um, if it's domestic, uh, for now, you only need to have your state ID or driver's license. In the very near, near future, if you're flying, um, even domestic, you'll need something called a real ID. Uh, and so that's going to basically be like a domestic passport for anybody who's flying from state to state. And so if you need to know more about that, definitely go to your driver's license uh, or your um, the, the DMV to find out more about that. You can also go on the Pennsylvania.gov uh, website to, to check that out. Um, if you're going abroad, you're obviously going to need at the very least a passport. Uh, and then you'll, you, you know, if it's for work and depending on what country, you might also need a work visa. And so that's something, uh, those work visas uh, for China or India, for example, it's a long application, it costs money, and you often have to put any past names. So if you've changed your name, you do need to be aware that it will request you to put any previous names, such as a dead name, on that application. And they also do a criminal background check. So that those are things to take into consideration. Um, some folks that might be sensitive, uh, you know, maybe, you had criminal history way back and, and you haven't gotten in trouble in a while, but your job, you know, maybe you're not fully out at your job with that information. And so that could end up bringing some things to the surface. Um, the big one for me though, is definitely thinking about that, um, having to put your dead name. Don't let it, you know, hold you up or prevent you from going somewhere. Um, some folks, it doesn't really bother them as much to have that. Um, but there's other stuff to uh, think about. So I always do a lot of research before I leave for a trip, uh, especially if I'm going somewhere new. I'm going to be online and looking at um, all the different resources that are out there, uh, such as some of the ones at the end of this pre presentation that are going to actually give you uh, insight on the laws and cultures in a certain area. Um, and then, uh, so these, these um, uh, even though it's fairly simple too, to, to get cash at a local cash point when you arrive in your destination, I always like to take some folding money with me before I leave. Um, so whether I'm going to the European Union and I need, and I need euros or if I'm going to um, the UK and I need British pounds or wherever it might be, uh, it's always good to have a little bit of folding cash in your, in your pocket um, just in case of emergencies. Another thing that's really common in, the, in uh, Europe that's just starting to catch up here in the US is contactless um, payments. Um, so over there, uh, they had those contactless credit cards that you could just 
you know, wave it in front of the cash point and it would basically, or the point of sale and it, and it would uh, take your payment. They're really handy. Um, you can also do that with a, uh, with a phone, whether it's an iPhone or a Samsung or whatever, uh, there's Google Pay and Apple Pay and so forth. So those are really handy to have. Always good to have more than one payment method, um, if if you ask me. So that's just something that I've learned. All right. Okay, and then how do we travel? So Corinne, this is uh, the uh, S, I believe it's the S-Bahn track in Munich, uh, in I think so Southern Munich. Um, I know you're into trains as are a couple of other folks, but uh, S-Bahn and U-Bahn are the are the most prevalent um, trains in, in the city of Munich. Very easy to ride as well. And they also have a good tram system too. Um, okay, so uh, you you might travel on foot, you might travel by motorcycle or bicycle. You might go by personal van or RV or another type of automobile. You might take a chartered bus or a coach. Uh, you might use public transit like the subway, a tram, a train, and so forth. High-speed rail uh, by air. And you might even, these days, we're doing a lot of traveling virtually. And as a, as a trans person, um, you know, Corinne, you and I were just talking about this the other day. When you're on a call with somebody, they don't always see you uh, and they, they might not, you know, know your pronouns or, uh, or whatever, right, or your gender identity. And so those are things to think about as well. Um, the, some of these methods of travel are, uh, might be a little bit more insular uh, for some folks. Like, you know, if you're driving a car, um, chances are you're... Uh, you're not going to, you're going to have the most amount of privacy, right? So, and I see, let's see. Oh yeah. So Corinne just pointed out that we have folks on from Alaska and California. Thanks for uh, underscoring that. This is something that I, I kind of took into consideration that it's not necessarily all local to Lehigh Valley. Um, so good to have you folks. And thanks for that, Corinne. Um, so there was one uh, handout that Corinne sent me a link to a few weeks back, and I liked it so much. A lot of what I, as I scanned through it, uh, a lot of it is stuff that I've kind of picked up along the way, um, but there's there are a lot of really good nuggets in there. And I forgot that linked in the end of this prezzo, but um, one thing it says in there is whether you're getting behind the wheel, boarding a plane, taking Greyhound, Amtrak, or regional rail, or even a ferry or cruise ship to reach your destination, you still need to carry some form of legal identification. Whether someone uh, checks it depends on how you go. And if you feel like more people are flying, you're right. Airline industry insiders say a record 823 million passengers flew in 2016. More than 88% of trans travelers though, drive according to AAA. Um, unless you're pulled over, driving provides the least risk of encountering anyone in authority to question your gender presentation. Uh, and of course, it's not always feasible to drive, nor as fast as rail travel. Um, rail travel is also more scenic. And while passengers must still present legal identification matching the name on the ticket, the good news is nobody will check the gender marker. Um, so that's that ID thing is definitely important. And it may come up again uh, as we go through these slides, but I do want to make sure that everybody is aware that, especially if you're traveling international or flying for anywhere, uh, your ID needs to match your reservation. And so it's really important to, if you're transgender and you are in transition, try to get that legal name change done ASAP. Uh, try to get your gender markers updated different identification forms that you should consider are your driver's license, your social security card, which by the way, there's no gender marker on the face of the social security card, but the social security administration does store that information in their database. And that goes along with your record. So that's something you wanna look into as you're doing your legal name change. And of course, passport is another one. And I also mentioned the work visas and other types of visas. Um, so. If you're worried about traveling somewhere and you go by your preferred name and you uh, identify as a gender marker that's different from what your legal identification says, unfortunately, you're going to need to use the gender and name that is on your form of legal identification with which you'll be traveling. Um, so again, just really important to uh, get, uh, get that updated. 
Um, I do have a little bit more about that though on another slide that we'll talk about. And I see that somebody said, Chelsea said, oh, wait, let's see, it looks like we've got. So Corey said, if you had a legal name change, is it, it is advisable to carry a copy of your name change order? Yes, thank you, Corey. And that's also on a slide as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Excellent point. Uh, and then let's see, Chelsea says, I'm going to Disney later this year. The reservation is under my legal name, but they are allowing my preferred name to be used for the entire stay. Always ask, you'd be surprised. Yes, yeah, so, and I know American Express uh, recently started allowing people to get uh, credit cards in their own preferred name rather than their legal name. Uh, I was able to do that a few years ago and that was really nice. And there's a lot of like Uber will allow you to have an account where you use your preferred name now instead of your legal name. Um, unfortunately though, with the TSA and with Customs and Border Con Patrol uh, or protection, I mean, um, they are going to expect to see the the same um, gender marker and le and name that's on your ID associated with your plane your boarding pass. So that's that's the one thing that you still need to be uh, aware of. Excellent points, everybody. Okay, so some other things to think about. So I love this picture. This is in Trafalgar Square in London. Uh, and it was just after London Pride in 2019. And uh, if you look at that walking uh, signal there, it's got the um, transgender symbol on it. And they did uh, several like that in, in the area of, in that area of London. So they had a lot of cool pride related um, lights. Um, so things to think about, who might you be traveling, or I'm sorry, who might you interact with while you're traveling? So these could be uh, drivers, such as bus drivers, Uber drivers, taxi drivers, maybe a driving service, uh, ticketing agent, um, TSA agent, other airport personnel, customs agents, uh, other fellow passengers. Uh, you're gonna interact likely with hospitality and service workers, police and emergency service personnel. Uh, the locals, <laughs> um, colleagues, and friends or family. Um, so these folks, whenever you're traveling, they come from all types of backgrounds, all beliefs, all identities. For some of them, it's their job to help or provide a service to you. For others, it's their job to ensure your safety. Others yet are there to protect their borders. No matter where you go, it's extremely important to be prepared. Um, so like I said, this includes carrying legal identification from the country where you reside. Uh, as somebody mentioned, and thank you, um, I've also made a habit of carrying my uh, several letters and forms with me. So uh, I carried my HRT prescriber's letter. So uh, my endocrinologist uh, wrote a letter for me to take with me. Also, my therapist gave me a letter to obtain HRT. Um, and so I carried with that declaring that I, I, I identify as transgender and identify as female and what my name, my preferred name is. Um, and then uh, also, once I had it, I carried the certified copy of the court order that I got when I had my legal name changed. And the reason that can be helpful is because it has your previous name on it, as well as uh, your new legal name. And so that, that'll be, if you ever need to make a connection between those two different records, um, you have a certified copy of a court order that does that for you. Uh, and then also carry copies of your, of your IDs. Um, it's, it's always good to have a backup. And I would just throw them in my, um, I always carry a, a book bag when I get on an airplane and that has like all of my stuff that I need within arm's reach at any, at any time. And um, that's where I would just stuff the letters and whatnot into there and have those as a backup. Um, so, oh, and thank you, Corinne. So is that, wait, who's, was that Corinne? It was. Um, so the last, the last she, comment, yeah. Yeah, so she says, we have templates for carry <coughs> letters, position letters, and more. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. Um, so sometimes, yeah, I do a lot of traveling alone. Uh, just about every time I've gone on a trip, I have at least gone to the airport, gotten on the plane, and uh, arrived on the other end and gotten uh, a ride to my hotel alone. And I've gone to some big cities and places I've never been by myself. Uh, and that can, that can be exciting. It can also be a little bit nerve wracking, uh, but then sometimes you'll, you'll be traveling with somebody else. Uh, and so if that's a colleague or friend, um, partner, family member, 
it's suggested that you discuss your concerns with them about being a trans or gender non-conforming person and traveling. Uh, agree on a plan for how that person might support you if anything comes up, whether it's misgendering, uh, other issues you need to trans folks, um, even if you just get separated, run into legal trouble or have an emergency. Um, and if this is somebody like a colleague who maybe doesn't know a lot about you know, the, the trans experience, um, then this could be an, uh, an opportunity for you to, uh, you know, help educate them a little bit. Um, but it's always uh, nice when you have somebody who's in your corner and, uh, and there to reinforce. Because a lot of times I feel like I'm the crazy trans lady if I'm, if, you know, if I'm making a stink or standing up for myself and I'm alone. Um, sometimes you can feel like you're like, like the spotlight is on you and you're in a fishbowl or whatever. Um, and that's not always the most comfortable place to be. <clears throat> also, uh, so if you're traveling alone, um, be sure to notify at least one friend or family member that you trust. Give them a copy of your itinerary. So I always share uh, my itinerary with my mother uh, and then an extra copy of any legal uh, or transition related documents and then stay in touch with them periodically. Um, that way, if something would happen, it might flag up for them if they don't hear from you in a while. I like that too, Corinne. Carry paper in case your phone dies. <laughs> yeah, especially if you don't have a converter or a charging cable or something happens to your charging cable or you just don't have access to electricity, having analog is always a good thing. <laughs> Excellent. So um, flying while trans internationally. So the reason I have this lovely picture of TK Maxx, um, which is different from a store in the United States called TJ Maxx, but almost has the exact same logo. I love little things like that about the UK. Um, the point being that things aren't always the same uh, where you're going as they are where you're from, even if they might seem similar. Um, so, and the point being that uh, in this case, an example that the reach of the TSA uh, ends where our borders begin. Um, and so trans travelers, according to the risk management firm, iJet International, should recognize that the way security personnel at airports outside the US treat transgender individuals is inconsistent, leading to situations where trans international travelers still face insensitivity and confusion, been there, done that. Um, such incidents can be emotionally difficult and disruptive to travel, to say the least. Uh, and so uh, it's, you know, it it is what it is. The TSA, I mean, there's plenty of horror stories about the TSA. I'm going to share with you a couple of my own. Uh, and, um, you know, they, but they do, the good news is they at least, they, so linked in this presentation, they, they actually have a, a page on their website for transgender travelers. Um, and they do have policies that are meant to protect trans folks. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but also whenever I'm traveling anywhere, it's always important to consider uh, what, what you take with you, right? So, um, I, whether I'm going on a two week trip or a two day trip, I usually pack the same. Uh, if you're a hardcore minimalist and you pride yourself in, in packing light, no matter what, good for you. Um, that's not me. <laughs> but you do want to keep in mind that you're going to have to lug this stuff around with you no matter where you go or give it up. Um, and so that's the thing is like, uh, don't, don't pack more than you want. I know the first couple of times I traveled somewhere early transition, I took a ridiculous number of shoes and a ridiculous number of suitcases full of clothing. Um, and part of that was just me coming into my identity and, and getting used to what works, right? Um, and it was like a three-day trip and I had, <laughs> I had like 15 pairs of shoes. So <laughs> um, anyway, um, but one thing I like to do is uh, always leave a little chunk of room, like empty space in my luggage so that um, I can go shopping. Love Charlene's comment, a shoe for every five hours. <laughs> uh, so as trans folks, we also may have cert uh, certain intimate or personal items, um, maybe medical items that we carry from packers to binders to dilators to wigs and breast forms, other prosthetics and so forth. Um, and going through security, it can be a stressful experience no matter who you are, uh, especially if the airport's busy and you're in a hurry to get to your uh, gate. 
Um, but it's, so it's important to know your rights. And um, so there's several resources, as I keep mentioning, that will help you with this. Uh, and one thing one of them says is, well, almost all passengers can decline using the full body scanner in favor of a pat down. Um, the TSA has uh, since 2015 been able to make that screening mandatory, what it calls enhanced screening for those selected. There's no alternative for those passengers. And I've been that passenger more than once. So I can say that before um, the pandemic, when I was traveling, um, last two times I traveled was in January and February of last year. And I spent a total of four weeks in the UK during that time. And when I traveled, I usually leave out of Newark airport and they were not um, making everyone. So like closer to 9-11, everybody was going through that like really invasive scanner. Um, for a long time, those scanners actually took like a picture of your naked body. Um, thank you technology. But now it just takes like, it looks for certain anomalies, so to speak, on, um, on the body as you go through it, but not everybody gets flagged for that enhanced screening. Um, but I, I have gone through that experience and then I was given um, a pat down. So what happens is when you're going through the line, uh, a, per a TSA agent has about a half of a second to click a pink button or a blue button. And in that split second, uh, if they pick the one, and by the way, I'm going to acknowledge that that's binary and needs, I mean, I wish they could fix that because it restricts you to one of two choices. And we already know that gender identity is not just limited to two choices. Even our president said that. Um, so, but it, they pick that and then it looks for a certain body shape and looks for parts to be all in what the binary heteronormative cisnormative system thinks it should be. And when something like that, an, an anomaly shows up, then you get to have a pat down as well. And really what they're looking for is not to, um, you know, discriminate against you as a trans person. They really just want to make sure that you're not packing anything on the plane that could harm other people. Uh, and so I have had a very intimate pat down. It was done by uh, an ostensibly a woman uh, and trans folks who are um, binary at the very least have the right to ask to request uh, somebody to do the pat down who is of the same identity or the same gender identity as they are. Um, and so if you're going through this pat down because either you selected it or because the TSA told you that you had to, um, and they can make it mandatory for you, you do have the right to the pat down by person same gender as you are presenting. You also have a right to have any invasive procedure, including a pat down performed in private. Um, and if you go to the private area, you have a right to bring a friend or a fellow traveler with you. Um, so all really important things um, to remember. Um, one other thing, and I don't remember if I have it on another slide, uh, but one other thing is uh, that uh, you can actually I see so the ID thing, going back to like, say your passport, right? If you have, uh, if your gender marker on your passport says one thing and you're presenting as uh, something else, that's okay. Uh, they can't, they don't have the right to give you any crap for, um, you know, presenting as female if your ID says male, for example. Um, and so that's not a problem. Uh, but just be prepared that they may, you know, they may ask questions that could be a little bit uh, invasive or uncomfortable. Um, somebody else said that, let's see. So, uh, oh, Corinne's asking, adding more comments. Dilators often show up as sh shampoo bottles. Um, packing these items, you may want to plan additional time to go through security. Most definitely. Um, the more you pack, be, you know, give yourself a, a wider window of time. I usually like to get to the airport extremely early, like ridiculously early. My dad uh, got me into that habit, but I do appreciate it because I get in there, I get through security and I can have a Bloody Mary and some breakfast while I wait for my plane. <laughs> so that's always nice. Uh, and then also, uh, so you said an example is that if the scanner reads you as male but sees metal clips on bra straps, you will be likely to get a pat down. Yeah, um, luckily, so when I'm gonna be really um, 
uh, explicit here. When I got my pat down, I was, so I have not had um, bottom surgery yet. And so I uh, was tucking when I was going through the airport and the person who did the pat down did um, put their hand in my crotch and um, did touch my crotch, but I suppose she was happy with what she found down there. So uh, after that, there were no more questions asked. So I know that's really um, explicit, but it, I think it's pertinent. Well, yeah, and I know I've always found, so I'm a woman who owns a penis and um, you know, I know that it's gonna show up, right? I just, you know, if, if, they, if, they're, if they read me as female, the penis is gonna show up. If they read me as male, the bra straps are gonna show up. And right. so it's just easier to handle things kind of pre preemptively right. and say, yes, I'm a person of trans experience and you're going to find a penis down there. Right? Yeah. So, and, and that's a great point, Corinne. And I think I might have that somewhere on a, on an upcoming slide. So I'll probably expound on that, but really being direct uh, and being forthright. And um, you know, the, the, and in fact, in a lot of these resources I've, I'm sharing, we, it does say that too. So just have the tough conversation and move on. Um, and usually I've, for the most part, I've had positive experiences with, with going through airport security. All right, so I'm going to sh share with you some uh, snapshots of my travels. That last one there is Kensington Palace in England. Um, so uh, one thing I always like to do uh, when I am getting ready to go somewhere is look up where the neighborhood is, um, the gay neighborhood. Uh, and if it's like, it's usually really easy to get to. Um, and I always like um, going to explore because you just generally can feel a little bit safer and more comfortable there. Um, that picture there is in Amsterdam at a club called The Wig. I didn't go in. <laughs> didn't look like my, my type of place. <laughs> um, but it looks like they were having fun there. Um, this is in Munich. So this is in their neighborhood. I forget what the name of it is, but that sign there is to uh, the two women uh, icons holding hands. And they had a few others, like two men walking across the street holding hands. And lots of fun stuff in that neighborhood. Very small in, in Munich. Um, and then, <clears throat> so um, this is G-A-Y in Soho, uh, London. So that's, that is a wonderful area. Lots of uh, great clubs to go to and other very friendly restaurants and stores to shop in. Um, and then uh, I do want to stress that um, when you, depending on where it is you're going, just because they have a neighborhood or a gay neighborhood in that uh, city, doesn't mean that once you leave that neighborhood that it's going to be safe and secure anymore. So in the neighborhood, you might feel like you're okay and you might be accepted, but just be prepared that as you leave that and as you go further away from that. Now, when I was in Amsterdam and Munich and in London, I've never really gotten too much of a vibe once I walked out of the, the gay neighborhood so or the LGBTQ friendly neighborhood. So I, um, I definitely still enjoyed that. All right, and then um, so side trips. Uh, just a little tip, if you're traveling for business and you're gonna be going for a long period of time, a couple weeks and you're over a weekend, uh, you can always think about paying out of pocket for a real quick jaunt to another country. And from London, it's really great like location to be able to get to anywhere in Europe. Uh, and so I've done this more than once where I've planned a quick side trip for a few days to go to another city um, and it works really well. So that's in Munich, that's the Glockenspiel, that's Chinatown in London. Um, so some tips on, or some advice on hotel staff. So I, the first few times I, I traveled for business, um, I was staying in a hotel. I didn't know which hotel was the one to go to. So I asked a coworker what he recommended. Um, and so I stayed in that same hotel on my four next trips. First time I was there, I was getting misgendered every time I was picking up the phone to order room service uh, and even got misgendered at the front desk. Even though my passport says female, my name says Emma, I still was getting misgendered and, um, you know, just wasn't wasn't too happy about that. Um, so what I did and, and Corinne mentioned it. 
was, uh, you know, I, I, I walked down to the uh, front desk and I asked to speak with the manager and I said, listen, uh, I'm transgender, I'm a woman, I keep getting called sir and mister by many of your employees here, I would really like it to stop. Um, and the guy, you know, it didn't go very smoothly at first. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, emotion involved on both ends. Uh, I felt justified. <laughs> um, and uh, but he eventually ended up coming to grips with the fact that, you know, it's right. I shouldn't be treated this way. It was really nice. And what was really cool is that um, one of the people who works at that hotel is transgender. She was not out or in transition. She came up to my room with a bottle of wine and she came out to me and gave me a hug. And I'm still Facebook friends with her today. She's now in transition. She's on hormone therapy. She looks amazing. Um, and, you know, so, so like where, wherever you go, just remember that you may bump into folks from the community. Just making sure I'm keeping up with the chat here, but it looks like Corinne, your handle in it. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so yeah, hotel staff, really good to just be direct with them. And usually they're, in some countries in Europe, it's even the law that you don't discriminate against LGBTQ folks. So um, that's really good to be aware of. All right. Um, and then drivers, that's another one. I have a million stories about drivers, whether it's the car service that takes me uh, to the Newark airport or the car service that picks me up at, at, um, over in England, uh, or if it's, especially with Uber drivers uh, and taxi drivers, you just, they, you know, they come from all walks. And I've had a lot of questions asked that I don't think were appropriate. I've had folks say things like uh, lifestyle choices to me, uh, many times, which is one of the things that'll really rub me the wrong way, um, and and so forth. So, um, sorry, I'm I'm logged in through a VPN and it's telling me I need to extend. So I just want to make sure I do that real quick so I don't lose everybody. Well, while I'm as <clears throat> I'm good me. now. Thank nope, you. You're good. Oh, never yeah, mind. Thank you. Sorry. Th did you have something to say or? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Kurt. Um, all right. Excellent. So uh, also making friends. So like I said, you can bump into folks who you never know um, where they come from. This girl, Katie is, uh, has a piece of my heart. She lives in Kingston over in the UK. In fact, she was just messaging me uh, about 20 minutes ago. I love her. I talked to her a lot. Uh, also, my coworker Santaraj from India. He and I met for a business trip one time. Uh, really great guy. And uh, and then here's some other colleagues as well. We're on the Surbiton uh, platform in uh, England, and that platform was actually in um, a Harry Potter movie. Uh, turf turf author aside, uh, I thought it was cool that that's in a Harry Potter movie. Um, and then it's always important to stay alert no matter where you go. Um, and you should have fun, but not too much fun. So one, one point there is like, I like to go out for, you know, maybe for work, you're having cocktails um, with some colleagues or whatever, a business dinner, always really important not to get, uh, you know, have too much to drink, um, especially if you're on your own, if you're getting a train home to the hotel or whatever, um, really always need to be very vigilant about your surroundings as a trans person, take that to like the 10th level um, and <clears throat> just make sure that you, you know your area. Okay, so let's talk about those resources. I appreciate everybody hanging on with me. Um, we're, we're nearing the end of the presentation, Corinne. I know I went a little longer than you'd originally asked, but hopefully folks are enjoying this and uh, we're getting something out of it. Um, so I did mention this, the LGBTQ Guide to Travel Safety. So this is what Corinne shared with me, really great. So this is an overall, I think like a 44 page PDF. Uh, and then it has a section called Traveling Will Trans. Um, one of my favorite trans authors and English professors is Jennifer Finney Boylan. Um, to the question, do I have to out myself? She says, no. However, trans travelers should always be prepared to disclose that they are transgender. Um, she says, I think the biggest danger for trans people, whether in the air or on the ground, is disclosure. Whom to tell and when. 
for some of us, those with, with passing privilege, especially those who have been through gender confirmation surgery, disclosure is a decision that can be largely left up to us. I rarely talk about my identity with strangers because it's hard to know when I'm safe and also hello, it's none of their business. I think lots of trans people have this sense of themselves. Um, guys and, and gals and folks, if you click this uh, image, um, the actual cover of that, you can it'll take you to the uh, the PDF on the web. So just a hint about that. Uh, another really great resource is e Equaldex. Um, so an Equality Index, it's a portmanteau of, of that. Um, so this is a crowdsourced uh, collaborative LGBTQ plus knowledge base, lots of data. Um, and I, I am just going to um, show you all uh, just a little bit on the web here, because I'd like you to uh, see that. Okay, so e equal dex or equal dex, however you want to say it. I hope you can all see that. Um, it, it's got this interactive map, uh, and then it has these different topics, right? So you can pick, homo uh, you know, homosexuality, uh, changing gender, adoption, so forth. So if we look at gender, we can actually mouse over these different countries. And uh, it will give us the little uh, pop up there or preview. Um, it's color coded. So this color is saying it's illegal to change your gender. Uh, there's also the, um, the light green, which is you can change it legally and surgery is not required. Uh, and then the reason the United States is legal but requires surgery is because there's specific states within the United States. Um, and, and even one state, lovely Kansas, where it's completely illegal to change your gender marker. Um, so this is a really useful uh, um, resource. And then they also give some of the these other uh, ways to look at the data down here. So status of LGBT laws by country. It gives you a breakdown. Um, it's all interactive. So you can click to dive further into the data. Uh, and then you've got each country listed here as well. Um, and then there's a lot more uh, else built into this. You can also click between the US and the United Kingdom. Um, so I would encourage everybody to uh, look at that if you get the chance. Okay. Um, so the uh, transgender, or not, sorry, National Center for Transgender Equality. Uh, the great resource, no matter who you are or, or what you're doing, if you're transgender or gender non-conforming, they have a specific travel page. Um, also a know your rights page about air, airport security. So that goes into more detail. Um, and just an important tip that's quoted from that site, um, going through the ID checkpoint at the airport, TSA travel document checkers will check as you enter security to ensure that the name on your ID matches your boarding pass. It doesn't matter whether your current gender presentation matches the gender marker on your ID or your presentation in your ID photo. And the TSA officers should not comment on this. So that's something I mentioned before. Um, other stuff on here. So there is a, a video on, on their page um, specifically for transgender passengers uh, or oh I'm sorry I'm, I'm jumping to the next slide TSA that's what I wanted to talk about <laughs> so the TSA um, is uh, a little bit behind the curve okay so they need to do some catching up after the last in the previous administration not to get political but um, their, their site definitely is in the 20th century so let's email them to help them um, brush it up a little bit but they do the good sign is that the TSA is actually trying to do something about transgender passengers and be aware of our unique uh, experiences um, and so they do have a page on their website, even a care, TSA CARES video. Um, I'm just gonna warn you though, that even though it's specifically for transgender passengers, it's awareness of trans issues is very limited. Um, and for example, the advanced imagery screening technology restricted to those binary choices I told you about. Uh, and then if prosthetics or body parts are found in places, the software doesn't expect them be, to be, the software will flag that passenger for further screening. Um, so definitely encourage you to check it out. It's a government site for the United States, so it's going to be a government website, but it's still worth uh, looking at. Um, and then similarly is travel.state.gov. So that's from the U.S. Department of State, uh, and they're going to have a page for LGBTI travelers. 
Um, it focuses mostly on the GL and B or the LGB, um, trans and intersex, even though in their acronym doesn't necessarily come to front very much. Um, there are a couple things they, they mention, including about gender markers and so forth on IDs. Um, they also allow you to uh, look up your destination. Uh, and so if you um, wanted to uh, specifically, if you're going to China, um, the nice thing is on their page is that they actually have, uh, you know, a breakdown of um, issues. So if you look at safety and security, I think it is. Or is it local laws and special circumstances? So under local laws and special circumstances, and they have a page like this for every country. Um, so they will give LGBTI travelers some details about that country, um, which I think can sometimes be very qualitative. So uh, definitely good to, to check that out. They even have this, um, uh, this human rights report. So there's a handful of, they go back like 2019, 2018, 17, 16. Um, so that can be helpful as well. It gives you some more detail on uh, what's happening in, in different countries. All right, almost to the end here, folks. Um, one other thing on that travel.state.gov page is a PDF. I'm a big fan of PDFs and handouts. Um, so this one's not like the best, but it's very pretty and colorful. Um, so it's just LGBTI uh, family travel tips. So it goes into a kind of a, a brief thing. So that's something if you're ever doing a, a seminar workshop or just want to keep that in your back pocket, that's, that might be good to have. Um, a couple other things just from a travel perspective that I want to call out. Um, so there's things that you can pay for that to kind of help streamline your going from country to country. Um, global entry is one. And um, so that's from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, and that's something you can pay for. They do. It kind of uh, fast tracks you from going when you're going when you reach a new country. Going through customs can always take literally hours uh, and can be a real pain and be very uncomfortable, uh, especially for somebody who's trans or gender non-conforming. Um, that global entry does also include TSA pre-check, uh, which gets you into a shorter line. And you don't have to, with TSA pre-check, you don't have to go through the invasive scanner. Um, you just go through a metal detector. You can keep your shoes on and your belt as well. So that's in light jackets. So that's nice. You don't have to take your laptop out of your bag. Um, so if you get global entry, you get TSA with it. Again, just be warned that it requires a background check and previous names. So be prepared to um, uh, do that as well. Uh, and then mobile passport. Uh, so TSA and Global Entry, those are those cost money. Mobile passport, you can download on your phone. It's an app. Uh, you can get a free version or you can also get a for $14.99 a year. You can get the, uh, the upgrade version um, where it stores your information. But what's cool about Mobile Passport, no more having to fill out the customs uh, form uh, that they give you on the airplane. Uh, in, and you have to stand in this really long line that can take hours to get through. Uh, you can actually go through the Mobile Passport line, which is a lot of air, major airports have this now. I've gotten through to mobile passport where there was nobody in line and there was on the other line, the regular line, there was probably about 500 or 600 people. And I was so happy to just jet right through that mobile passport line. And what it does is allow you to take a picture of your, uh, your passport and then fill out the like eight or nine questions that they ask when you're coming through customs. Um, so that's good. And then international SOS that costs money, but this is another site that you can sign up for uh, and it'll give you regular updates. It'll also track you there. So it includes geolocation, which is nice. There's a couple of different programs that you can get where um, they include geolocation. So if you ever get lost or uh, go missing, that, that can help. Um, and then look into your airline specific benefits programs and always remember to sign up for the rewards clubs because um, you got to get those miles and those free nights. So anyway, mm -hmm. folks, I'm sure there's a million other things I could have talked about, um, but that's all I have. So I want to thank you all for joining. Corinne, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if you had a comment. I'm also willing to stay on and take some questions. As yeah, well. we'll wait a minute to see if people have some questions. Um, while that's going on, one thing I, I do want to touch on, though, is the importance of safety. And I know 
you know, I was telling Emma just before the call here about a situation that I had when I was traveling here just recently and um, that, you know, was a little bit scary. And it's important that, you know, you know, you generally speaking, because we mainly have trans women, it looks like here on, on the, uh, the call, um, is that, you know, follow just basic good security practices, right? So stay in well-lit areas if you can, uh, you know, stay in a group versus, you know, going by yourself, you know, do those things. There's reasons why women go to the restroom in groups, right? You know, these, these are just you know, kind of simple, basic things. Have your keys in your hand. Um, you, know, you know, don't have, you know, be you know, weighed down a lot if you can avoid it. So these are things that you can do to just really try to be smart and avoid risk. Yeah, excellent point. Also, before I, I address this um, question from Maggie, uh, thank you, Maggie. I did want to mention too. So, um, in in Europe, most of Europe, they are really good about having non bi or sorry, all inclusive or all gender bathrooms in a lot of places. Another really cool thing is like they most of the stalls in the countries I've been to have a full door, a full length door. Imagine that with no cracks that people can stare through. Uh, so you get ultimate privacy. So going into a bathroom, the, the bathroom that matches your gender identity is a lot less invasive and a lot less nerve wracking in those cases. So thank you. So it looks like we have a few things coming through. Um, so Maggie Hansen, thank you for your point. So you're asking as a hotel staff member and an LGBTQ resort, how can you make the experience better? And even, even after working there for five years, you still mess up and accidentally call people by ma'am and sir. So I just have to say that I really wish we would, as a society, do away with ma'am and sir. Um, I've actually spent like significant amount of time thinking about what a solution to this might look like. And um, it's tough because I, I was just telling Corinne uh, the, the other, or was it you? I, I've told a few people this story. So last week I had to go get a touch up for my face for laser, which I haven't had to go in like two years. And it, that alone was already uh, annoying and dysphoria inducing. And then I, I had to go and call before I, they would let me in. And the guy calls me, sir, and had the name wrong. And, and like all of this stuff shouldn't have happened. And it was a place that I consider a safe place where I would never have that kind of experience and ended up going south. So um, I would just say, try to, if you know somebody's name, um, I would use their name instead of ma'am or sir. Mr. and Miss or Mrs. can also be um, tough. And another note is that when you're in another country, it's hard to understand sometimes because the, the dialect or the accent or the voice inflection, it might be hard to, to tell whether they're saying Mr. or Miss or whatever. Um, but I, I would say the best advice I can give you is just always ask them before you assume and call them Sir, Mr. or Miss or Mrs. or Ma'am um, and just say, you know, you might, I know it might hard, be hard the first few times, but say, you know, how would you prefer me to address you? Uh, or what is, what, you know, what is your preferred name? Or what's your preferred, uh, what would you like me to refer to you as? Um, I know folks can be a little bit nervous about asking that sort of thing, but it really is with a, with a trans person or a person who's gender expansive or LGBTQ, I think they're really going to appreciate the fact that you took the time to do that. Yeah, and a really a, a great best practice is to teach um, our people to use their name. So when somebody comes up to the front desk or they're a server, you just you know, teach them that when they're that first interaction, they come up and they say, you know, by the way, my name is Corinne and my pronouns are she and her, you know, how can I help you? And then that encourages people to share their name, right? Yeah, and, and you could even ask for the name if they want it sets the example and it kind of makes, it helps them to invite them to, to get into that same habit. And, and great point, Corinne. So I always tell people, especially when I'm on the phone and they can't see me and they're going to hear my voice, I say, hi, my name is Emma Smith. Um, that's almost always. And if I'm in a meeting for work, I always, before I talk, I always say, this is Emma. Um, and that way everybody knows who's speaking. Um, but yeah, great point, Corinne, about um, saying your name and pronouns when you meet somebody. Um, so just going through, so if you opt to skip the advanced imaging at an airport, is that a private room they take you to? Not, not right away. So um, they, they will offer to do the um, pat down first, and it would be out in the open. Um, if you weren't comfortable with that, you can request a private room, and then they will go with you. And you can also ask to have somebody accompanying you, so accompany you, whether it's somebody you know or just a third person 
um, you can make that request. Uh, and then like we said, you can also request to have um, uh, uh, have that um, done privately as well. So, um, so one person said, this is not travel, but I Uber for part-time work. Did you have to call or was on their site? Um, thank you folks who, who are saying it's hard to believe I'm misgender. I'm not quite sure, Jamie, um, what your question is about, but the one thing I did want to say about Uber, um, and no offense, cause I was an Uber driver too. I've had two very, uh, serious issues, uh, incidences with Uber drivers. One was in Allentown, Pennsylvania. The other one was in the UK. Um, and in both cases, the, the one in Pennsylvania involved police and pepper spray. Uh, but I did want to say first, when you're going somewhere, if you are taking anything that is protection, like pepper spray or a weapon of any kind, be sure what the laws are. And international travel, you're not going to be taking a firearm with you. Um, but make sure, like, you know, in Pennsylvania, it's legal to pepper spray, pepper spray somebody in self-defense. In Philadelphia, however... It is not. So you want to be really sure what the laws are around self, uh, self-defense and protection. Um, the other thing is with Uber, I have when I've called their service line, which used to be really hard to even find where you go on the app to call. Um, I, I, they do respond quickly, especially if it's a safety related incident. And in both of these cases, I was being misgendered in the one in Allentown, I was kicked out of the car and then chased by the man who was yelling terroristic threats at me. And so I decided to pepper spray him, but uh, because I was terrified. Uh, but the one in England, a guy got mad because I asked him not to call him sir. Uh, and he, uh, he, he had just put my luggage into the boot of his car. And when I said that, he got mad at me and he threw my luggage onto the wet pavement. And then as he was getting back in his car, made sure to call me sir a few more times. So, um, but you know, with Uber, um, it, they, they're the, they can't really control what the drivers do, but they, they, when you call for support, they are usually really good about that kind of stuff. And they do take LGBTQ issues seriously. Um, when, as far as I'm guessing, can you register with the, so on yeah. the Uber question, I don't know if you're asking about the, the person, the prefer, preferred name or not. Um, but you, you may have to call their support line, uh, to make sure that you have your preferred name in there. That may be an issue because they do tend to do, to match it with, um, your ID and your criminal background. And so as a driver, I don't know how it works now with their policies, but as a rider, I believe you can use your preferred name. Yeah. Can you register with the secretary of state where they would know you are trans in their tra passport database? As of right now, I'm not aware of any um, gender identity marker. I don't know, Corinne. If yeah, so the, yeah, the answer to that's no. So, so the, yeah. the that's state the department record. at this point, they recognize passports as male or female. Uh, there's yeah. likely to be a uh, non-binary opportunity coming up soon, we hope, but these things yeah. usually take several years to implement. And but, I would um, imagine, I mean, some states actually have a non-binary option on their state IDs. And so you would think like if somebody uses that third or fourth option, how do they get a passport then when they go to get a passport? So, yep, they get to choose from M or F. Yeah. Also, folks, just one thing I want to sneak in there, and I'm sorry I keep talking, but um, with the passport. So if you've never had a passport before and you want to get one, I would encourage you to, if you're transgender and in transition or thinking about transitioning, I would encourage you to get your legal name change done before you get your passport. But there is a way to on the passport uh, website, and you do this through your post office um, and then the State Department is to um, pay for a corrected passport so you can get an updated passport with your name change information. I'm sure Corinne has more details on that as well. Um, oh, and I see Charlie, you said in, in Illinois. Yeah, and I think like New York has X as well and maybe Massachusetts. I can't remember all the places, but yeah. Well, um, thanks everybody for your time. I've taken way too much of it. So thank you all so much. Um, Corinne, I want to thank you again. I just want to give a plug for Dr. Samina Wahab. I'm a happy customer um, and I'm going to be there when she gives her presentation 
uh, next week and then I'll be with you Corinna as well. So great. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, we will be having um, uh, in a couple of days, this uh, presentation will be available on our YouTube page. We'll also put links to all the documents and websites that um, Emma was so kind to research for us. And we'll have those uh, on our Facebook page over the next uh, uh, few days as well. So, Thank you all so much. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye, Corinne. Bye.